It's week 10. Now, remember, next week is your HESI. There is no class. Your HESI is your class. Go on to Evolve, see when you're scheduled, and you'll know when to go to campus to do your exams, okay? Because all of them are on campus. Um, week 12, I'll put in 6 o'clock for uh, the class for to show up. Now, all you have to do on week 12 is to show up at one of my open sessions. I'm going to have two. I'm going to have it on Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And I'm going to have it on Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern time. If that does not work for you, let me know. And I'll quick pop on, ask you a couple of questions, make sure everything looks okay. And we will, um, you know, you'll be okay with your attendance. Because if sometimes you miss week one, for whatever reason, you didn't attend week 12, that's two consecutive weeks of non-attendance. That will make you a program drop, okay? And I don't want anybody to get there. So please, I'll be bugging you. If you don't come, I'll be bugging you. Please, I don't want anybody to have anything like that happen. I will try. So if you hear me listening, I need to talk to you, please. When can I meet you? It's just a quick on and off, all right? All right, let's go ahead and let's do this Kahoot. Now, this is now the um overall we're now looking at the entire program now all the pediatrics anything there's growth there's development i mean look at all the the uh systems of the body cardiac is just not like adults is it and then you're seeing other stuff the gi gu that has some crazy things in it that it's not in adults so um a lot of stuff you've learned this quarter. I hope I've helped you enough to get you through this and on through your NCLEX and on to being some amazing nurses that I think that you will be. all right let's just get going i know you're all tired it's been a long week and we're it's getting even tighter going into week 11 so a toddler swallows grandma's digoxin what are orders what are you going to anticipate is going to be ordered on that child what's your concern you know, toddlers put everything in their mouth. I mean, some of the teaching of this is, you know, to keep meds locked and have poison control number next to you. But remember, that child's coming in possibly digoxin toxic, which means their heart's going to slow down and maybe stop beating. So we need to get rid of that digoxin quick by giving digoxin, immunofab, or digibind. It's a pharmacology question, but we're pulling it into pediatrics now, okay? A multi. Signs of respiratory distress in infants. What do you see if a little baby is in respiratory distress? And I think this is probably one of the scariest things for me to see. Having an infant respiratory distress, there is no backup. There's nothing, no reserves. And when they go down, it is quick. So they're restless because they're becoming hypoxic. Yeah, infants do too. And it's that flaring nostrils and at the end of a breath, eh, eh, eh. if you hear that, get the doctor, get that child in the trauma room. You're going to need some sort of respiratory care now. Now, if that child was bradycardic, that is right before their code, right before. When a pediatric patient has an amputation, what priority teaching is very important. Now we talked about an osteosarcoma and taking the limb, right? Trying to salvage the limb and for the prosthesis, but we didn't talk about prosthesis care. Is it different from adults or children? Not at all. It's the same concept. 
make sure we keep that stump free from infection and free from breakdown because let's say it's for the leg then you can't get you know around that's your ambulation that's your freedom so making sure that we keep it good absolutely a multi what is acute myelocytic leukemia in children and what are the symptoms well we have all easier to cure and then AML, it's actually a more difficult cancer, but it is curable today. And then try to think of all the things you know about leukemia. Down children are more apt to get it, right? Leukemia, there's no immune system. So what are you going to see? Cancer's eating the red blood cells. They're anemic. They're eating platelets. They're going to be bruising. They have no white cells because they're all eaten up. That's their main cells they like. So infections, and then they get into the bone and the joint pains and over general overall malaise and fever. It's all of them. A multi. Maybe a problem seen after surgery for tetralogy of the low. So it's not only surgery for tetralogy of flow, it's any congenital heart defect. After they do surgery, you've got a heart that they've rerouted and put, you know, blood flowing in different ways and heart's got to get used to it. So these children will be fatigued. They will have a poor appetite. And because their heart's so weak, they can go in congestive failure, which equals respiratory distress you would see an elevated heart rate when they're in congestive fever, not in a uh, low heart rate. Multi. Defects associated with tetralogy of Fallot. Remember, tetralogy is the pulmonary artery. It's the right side of the heart. So anything that's right-sided is tetralogy. I mean, there is that overriding aorta, yes, But tetralogy is the pulmonary artery. There's some obstruction of some sort. That's the main thing with it. With the right ventricle gets stretched out when blood can't flow up. And then there's that VSD. Aortic stenosis, it's on the left side. It has nothing to do with tetralogy. Okay, so that's a key to remember. Is it right-sided or left-sided? An 18-year-old parent wants his lab results. Do you have to give those parents, their 18-year-old child, the results? You will always see consent things, legalities. HIPAA is always part of um, your HESI and your NCLEX. Always you'll see it. Remember, an alert-oriented 18-year-old has complete power over their care, and you don't have to tell the parents anything. You've got to get permission from the child, okay? Something to remember. What is Synergist and why is it given? Remember that matching of all of those different things. We have prostaglandins, we have endomethacin, we have Synergist. What are they all? It's something you should read, really look at. You'll always see questions on that. Synergist is the RX RSV vaccine. It is given once a month, only the first year of life from late, um, from early winter to early spring. Okay. So it's not even in a whole year, but only the first year. When do we give it? We give it to those immunosuppressed, premature, respiratory problems cystic fibrosis, heart disease, whatever. We give it to them because we don't want those babies to get this RSV. It's hard enough to suck, swallow, and breathe without extra mucus and a little fever. So we give the RSV vaccine, Synergist, so that they can have an easier first year of life. It's the highest priority with a preoperative infant with bladder extrophy. <laughs> What's bladder extrophy? Phenomphalocele, gastroschisis, 
bladder and extrophy. It's all something inside born on the outside of the body. And I've seen them all and they do happen. What is our priority? Well, if my insides are born on the outside of my abdomen, I've got to make sure it stays clean because I've got to put it back in eventually, right? And the surgeons, whatever, the urologist, urosurgeon, or the you know GI surgeon, general surgeon, they're going to come in every day and get that abdomen ready to stick it back inside, stretching it out. So we want to keep it free from infection. A 10-year-old wants an insulin pump for type 1 diabetes. Is this a good idea or not? Should they be able to control a little pump, which administers boluses and a continuous infusion, regular insulin? Should we? And actually, it's a great option. Think about him, how many times a type 1 diabetic Usually they're two or three years old when they're diagnosed early. So these children at 10 have been tired of four, five, six times a day sticking themselves with needles. So we put one needle in with a pump that's attached and we don't have to change it. And I've actually had a student with type one diabetes with a pump. And she said, you used to change the needle every 10 to 14 days or unless it needed to be replaced. I don't know what policy is, but can you imagine once a week versus six sticks a day? So that's the difference. And many 10-year-olds are alert, oriented, and smart enough to be able to handle their own care. A multi. When and why would a Lyme test be done on a child? Well, what's a Lyme test? It's actually very difficult to be able to diagnose. I've had some Lyme um, test positive uh, children that were admitted because of crazy cardiac um, symptoms and just overwhelming. Nobody could figure out what's going on. And they've gone from the Northeast. They've come down to South Florida where... I was, and they found out it was, it was on a vacation. They were out in the woods. It was a tick that bit them. And then what we did is we looked at the Borrelia burgerodoferi. That's actually the name of the bug. Um, and then we know that Lyme test, we might see the wheel, the redness, and know that they were bit, but you can't test for at least one to two weeks afterwards. So that's all about Lyme tests. Remember, Lyme test is where we should encourage them to cover up as much as we can if they're out in the woods in areas where, you know, ticks and bugs are so they don't get bit. What might you see after administering a bolus of albumin to a child? So there's 5% albumin, 10%, 25% albumin, and we give it because it's protein. And sometimes children get swollen and all this interstitial swelling and all over the place. And this pulls all that fluid back into the blood volume. And the albumin is that protein. It's that thing that sucks it in. And then usually we would give a dose of furosemide afterwards. Let's give some Lasix, you know, that furosemide, let's, the, the diuretic, let's make you urinate after you've been given that protein, it forces it to suck in that extra fluid. The thing you see is absolutely an increased urine output, you know, and now the protein's being replaced in your blood. So drug administration is a lot easier too. A multi. What is another term for erythemia infectiosum? Now we don't get to go over a lot of common childhood illnesses. This is one that's been on a HESI, on actually on an NCLEX. So I pulled it in. It is a viral disease that children get. It is contagious. And the big thing, it's called slap cheek. It is, they look like their cheeks have been smacked hard and they're big and they're red. 
It's also called fifth disease, okay? One of those questions, um, I can't go over everything. So this is the one that I have here on the, on the uh, cahoots for you. What's the treatment for pertussis? Well, we know there's a vaccination, but it doesn't mean you're not going to have a child with pertussis. I've had them. It's all respiratory, right? They need to go in reverse flow rooms as quick as you can. So how do we treat pertussis? It's a bacteria. And Dithromax or Azithromax is the drug of choice. And that's what we would be given. How do you get rid of cradle cap on an infant? You know that white, crusty stuff? You know, you'll have parents, they have, especially on little girls, they want to put cute little bows and barrettes in their hair, and their head is full of this white, flaky. How do you get rid of it? You scrub it hard. So what we're going to do is we're going to wash it with soap and water like normal. But they say put mineral oil, a moistener of some sort on there. And mineral oil is actually a very good choice. Or um, coconut oil actually is another one they use on infants. And then a fine tooth comb very easily, you know, try to get it out. It's not going to come out on the first try. It could take a week or so but you can get that hair looking better, that scalp looking better. Post-operative abdominal surgery child has an elevated heart and respiratory rate. What assessment might you make? Why is that? Post-abdominal surgery, their heart rate, respiratory rate is elevated. What do you think this could be? Probably pain. You know, you actually can see a child in pain in a paralyzed and sedated child because all of a sudden their heart rate goes up, their blood pressures go up. And you're like, oh, that just happened. So, you know, of course, looking out for um, making sure that there's no fever, not dehydrated, those things, looking at it, give a little extra pain medicine and they usually calm right down. So it's a key, that's one of those key assessment tools that we use for pain, heart rate and respiratory. What can cause rheumatic fever? So rheumatic fever is caused by a strep throat infection that wasn't treated properly or not at all. And rheumatic fever, what does it look like? Well, that could be the swollen joints, could be a rash, could be a fever. Um, these children can also get a heart valve damage. Um, and then that weird movement, chorea. Now, everything could be turned around. Treat the strep, giving them the antibiotic. The only thing that can't be treated is that heart valve. Once it's damaged, it is damaged. And they'll just have to do medical or surgical treatment for it. An adolescent girl wants information regarding birth control. What does the nurse do? Do you give her information? So any adolescent who wants information on birth control as a nurse, we can give them written and oral information, not our opinion, only facts, okay? Yes, they are allowed to get it, and no, they do not need parent uh, consent. Who will die? How do you control GERD in infant? Gastroesophageal reflux disease. The little spit-ups that come all the time with some of these infants. And the problem with GERD is they're losing calories. 
So many of these children don't gain as way they they should. Uh, the weight also cognitively they need nutrition, right? So we'll do the all all the things that keep vomiting from you know occurring, burping them frequently, not overfeeding them, not um, keeping their head elevated for thirty two minutes to an hour afterwards. And the other thing is as simple as little bit of rice cereal in the formula. And it's actually one teaspoon or five mLs into one ounce of breast milk or formula. It thickens it enough to keep it down. And usually they don't need any medicine besides that. A multi. A 15 month old brings the spoon upside down to their mouth. The mother asks, is this normal? So you have a toddler trying to feed themselves. The spoon's upside down or backwards or not normal. Is that okay? And the thing is, you just ask the mother why she's concerned. Maybe she has a friend's kid or knows somebody with problems, they're concerned. Um, that's normal because they're experimenting. That's what toddlers do, upside down and backwards, and they want to do it their way, right? And maybe even just smush it with both hands in their mouth. But that's what toddlers do. It's normal. It's actually a good thing. It shows good cognition. Multi. How is juvenile idiopathic arthritis treated? J-I-A. So JIA, number one for pain is NSAIDs. That is the drug of choice. For flares, it's the steroids. And they put them on methotrexate and sometimes also with biologics like Humira. Synergist is for RSV. A toddler's vomited two times, but listless and irritable. What do you tell the mother on the phone? I guess she called into the doctor's office or into the ER. What do I need to do? What would you tell her? Well, I have actually had children a um, couple, couple of years old vomit one big, huge one and were dehydrated. So listless, irritable, that is dehydration you need to get that kid to the ER. They've already vomited. You're going to keep them NPO at this point. You don't want aspiration or anything like that. So get them to the ER and they can treat them there. An adolescent status post amputation for osteosarcoma is angry and blaming the parents. Why are they doing that? So remember, they've lost a leg. They are going through the grieving process, right? So this is an absolute normal way. At first, is blaming everybody else. That is part of it. So it's a normal reaction. A multi. What should the nurse assess with children with hypo and hyperpituitaryism? Did I tell you about the pituitary gland? We have the posterior, which is fluid, and the anterior gland, which is all about growth. So what is one way I say every visit, we can go and look at this and these children, we can do things. Are they having enough um, hormones, uh, the thyroid hormones? Normal height and weight say so many things with children. It's one of the reasons why we do it. Like if they don't have enough thyroid hormone, they're not gonna gain weight. If they have celiac disease, they're not going to gain the weight. Cystic fibrosis, they're not going to gain the weight because they're losing all the things. So height and weight is so important. Part of it is measuring for hypo or hyperpituitarism. A multi. An infant with TE fistula, what should the nurse have at the bedside? What is a TE fistula? 
a tracheal esophageal fistula. You have a tube connecting the trachea and the esophagus. What are you worried about? I'm worried about choking. So you're going to have suction equipment at bedside and the head of the bed elevated. That's about all you can do. These children are NPO. They're getting nothing by mouth. It goes down. It goes directly into the lungs. So we won't be feeding them at all. Okay. It's one of the reasons we sometimes figure out they have this. Because the first feed, we find them gagging and choking and turning blue. We're like, oh, stop the feed. And then they go looking. A child's been having diarrhea for three days. What should the nurse check? What assessment do you want to look at? What's your concern? Diarrhea three days. What's that complication that biggest concern? And we're worried about dehydration. So we're going to be checking the heart rate. Is the heart rate normal for that child? So are, do they need PO or do they need POIV replacement fluids? A multi. What is a VP shunt used for? Ventricular peritoneal shunt. Remember, this shunt goes behind the ear. There's a big tube here that you could, the neurosurgeon can push. We don't touch it. And the tube goes in front of the body down into the peritoneal cavity. And this drains fluid when the body cannot drain it itself. So it relieves the pressure of hydrocephalus. And it just drains it into the peritoneum. You can do abdominal girths too to make sure that's not getting too big, but it is absolutely to keep that pressure off the brain. What would you see with a child with autism, ASD? So these children, you'll see in a corner, sitting by themselves, not responding to your call usually, doing the same action over and over and over again. Taking a toy, putting it on a ledge, taking another toy, put it next to it, taking a thing and putting it on top. Take the thing on top, putting it down, taking the toy, and it's over and over, and it gives them comfort. And that's what those repetitive behaviors and some that I've actually witnessed myself. A multi. A mother of a child diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy wants more children. What are you going to tell her? So Duchenne muscular dystrophy comes from mommy. So it's X-linked recessive. So mom needs to know that. And you would absolutely just recommend genetic testing. So those are the things that would be recommended. Yeah, you can never ask your doctor, but that is what's needed. A multi. An umbilical hernia has become hard and painful. What should you tell the parent to do when called? So another parent's calling you on the phone. You're in the doctor's office. That little, little squishy, squishy belly button is hurting. It's painful. It's red. What do I do? Well, what is a hernia? Isn't that the intestines that's pulled out of the body? There's an opening. And if it's painful, it's probably incarcerated or strangulated. So make the child NPO, absolutely. That kids go into the OR and get them to that pediatric OR where they can do a surgical intervention because that's the only thing they can do. Take that intestine and stretch it out to keep the blood supply there so it doesn't die. What acid-base imbalance is caused by hyperventilating? We've talked about diarrhea. 
you're losing alkaline, you know, you talk about vomiting, you're losing acid, so it's always opposite. So which one is, and is respiratory alkalosis, okay? I have seen HESIs with four different acid base questions. So this is why I have incorporated these, you know, throughout your cahoots. A multi. The child's falling and a stick has scratched their eye. What should you tell them to do? I guess they went. Like asking you because you're the neighbor, right? What are you going to do? I've always been the nurse, the doctor for everybody's children getting sick. So what is our concern about having a child scratching their eye? Well, we're worried about corneal damage. We're worried about penetrating things. So what do we do? Cover it up. And they say, actually, now cover both eyes up. Get them to that pediatric ophthalmist or get them to an ER. And they can go ahead and um, evaluate the eyes. It's better to protect them, send them, or to do anything and cause more harm. An infant arriving at the ER is congested, febrile, capillary refill is less than two. What should the nurse do? Infant congested febrile. What do you think could be happening here? And what is your concern? So this is the one, probably it's an RSV, but you can't be, you know, certain about it. Infants always with these, you know, you would take and you would separate them. They're considered a quote, a dirty room, which means only that person can go into one room because you don't want to put two in the same and they're just, you know, contaminating each other, my respiratory illness and your respiratory illness. So keep them isolated. You don't want to give something to somebody who can't tolerate having that. So a school-aged child is reoccurring dermatitis eczema. What suggestion would a school nurse provide to parents? So this is a child who's always breaking out, eczema, this dermatitis. And we know with that, it can you know, get to the point where it's a moment of flare, it's oozy and juicy, and they're scratching it, and they can't go to school, right, At, during these times. So what, what would you tell a parent? Well, if they're having flares, they need to just keep them home until they're not oozy and juicy because if you send them to school, they're just going to get an infection. And, you know, the school systems today will send home their homework. You know, hypoallergenic, what does that mean? I mean, what's hypoallergenic for me is not for you. So, no, um, you wouldn't worry about the lunches. A multi. Why do you give aspirin to a child with Kawasaki disease? Kawasaki, we learned that in week five, cardiac. So multi-system vasculitis, and you'd be concerned about coronary artery aneurysms. The biggest thing is those vessels are very fragile. The little microembolises are getting spewed into the blood system. So what is aspirin? It's an anti-inflammatory, number one. It thins the blood, number two, which prevents clots. Pain relief, they don't have pain with Kawasaki. They have a fever, could help with the fever, but not for pain. How do you medically close a patent ductus arteriosus? Remember, that's what's open for fetal circulation. That gives the oxygen from the pulmonary artery connects to the aorta, connects oxygen to the body. Sometimes we want it open and sometimes we want it closed. Well, when we want it closed, we give in to medicine. When we want to keep it open, we mimic mom's um, hormone called prostaglandin, okay? That keeps it open. Sometimes we need to get the oxygen to that body because nothing else is. Indomethacin is what we do to close it. A child post tonsillectomy is swallowing every two minutes. What would you do? 
Is that okay? What do you want to get that child? So if a post tonsillectomy is swallowing, it's the back of the throat. It you know those scabs that they have made after they remove those tonsils, it's probably picked up and is bleeding. So look, just have them open their mouth. You see bright red blood. That child needs to probably go back to the OR and get recauterized. Not uncommon. It does happen. <laughs> a child is walking on their tippy toes all the time. Why? I had my daughter's best friend's child. I met her when she was two and she was walking on her little tippy toes all the time for no reason. It wasn't because she was playing, just walking on the tippy toes. It is not normal. And it's uh, actually this girl was diagnosed with a type of autism and she was referred to the neurologist and now is getting care and she doesn't walk on her tippy toes all the time anymore. She walks better. So it is not normal. It's not that she's trying to do it. It's just neurologically what her mind is telling her to do. How about I? What treatment should a child in pain with JIA have? <clears throat> Juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So I like cold. You know, I have rheumatoid arthritis. I've been upfront with that. Many of um, people with arthritis like heat. It's a choice. You put heat on me and I feel worse. You put cold and it numbs it, I guess. And that's what I like. NSAIDs, drug of choice. And then, of course, with children, anybody in pain gets distractions. I'm glad that you saw that. An infant sweat tastes salty. What would you do? Mom says, you know, my baby tastes really salty. What is that? <clears throat> and definitely that cystic fibrosis. Now, if they were meconium ileus with that, we would go, all right, we know that is cystic fibrosis. How about I? How do you diagnose hip dysplasia in an infant? What is hip dysplasia? It's when the doctor initially takes the knees up and down and backwards, right? What are they trying to figure out? Well, the hip, instead of being born in the socket, is usually higher. So you're going to have that leg shorter than the other one. You're going to hear that clicking going on in the Ortolani maneuver. And you're going to see if turn them over on their bellies. That but buttocks, one's going to be higher than the other. Foot pointing inward, outward, that's all adults, that's fractured hips. That is not children. What causes acute glomerulonephritis? Well, again, that's another strep infection. Remember, everything with acute gamagonephritis can be turned around if caught soon enough and treated for that strep infection. It is said it can become chronic after one year of treatment and it doesn't turn around. So getting it you know, treated quick is the key there. Multi? Maybe a problem seen after surgery for tetrazia of flow. <clears throat> Again, cardiac surgery. Tetralogy, I told you they love that the, use the word tetralogy for all their cardiac stuff. Estes love it, NCLEX love it. That's their big congenital defect. So again, cardiac surgery, what would you expect? Fatigue and easily or appetite, respiratory distress, congestive failure. Very good. I asked this question in another way earlier. So good. 
multi. A child with pertussis is seven azithromycin IV. Priority to include in this child's plan of care is what? Whenever you give an antibiotic, zithromycin, what are you going to look for? So again, any sort of antibiotics, you're going to look for nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Those are those side effects you might see. Also, you want to worry about, of course, any sort of anaphylaxis, any sort of reaction, facial swelling or to carry, et cetera, et cetera. Why do sickle cell patients have enuresis? Well, think about what we teach sickle cell patients. The whole thing is to keep them hydrated because when they're not hydrated, those cells get stuck. That causes all of those crises, right? So we're drinking, 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 and then at night, they're going to wet the bed. And that's why they do it. Very simply, you get a lot of fluids. An infant scheduled for a cleft lip repair, which information is priority to convey to the surgeon before surgery. So you have all this information. Is anything there you should relay to the doctor? So a red blood cell count of 2.3 million is abnormal. This is something that would be conveyed to the surgeon. Also, a white blood cell of 10,000, that's actually borderline normal. It would have to be higher than that to show an infection. When administering indomethacin to an infant with a patent ductus arteriosus, anticipate which outcome. What are you waiting for? How do you know this indomethacin is working? Just think about all the information. PDA, what do you know? If you have a, a patent ductus arteriosus that's open, it's like a washer machine murmur in there. It's a loud one that's going on. So if you're giving indomethacin, your goal is to close it, which is closing that murmur. So that murmur should be decreased or should be gone. And last question, when solid foods are be when should solid foods be introduced to an infant? Always remember one at a time, four to seven days uh, in between. And actually rice cereal is your best one to start because it's the least uh, allergenic. Elizabeth, good job. Number three, number two, Kimberly, good job. And number one, Libby, good job, Libby. Mayor Bear and Rhea, so good job, guys. So this is our last class together. Last time I'm going to teach you anything unless you come to my review. And then I'll teach you a little bit more. Um, I tell you, it's been a great class. I've enjoyed you. I see you for a little bit on week 12 to make sure that everything's good and to get your attendance that week. It's really important. Anybody who has any questions, comments, or concerns, you let me know. Now, I'm going to tell you one thing. Whenever I get an exam, 